number seven ministries the spirit of the lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed number seven ministries welcome everyone to number seven ministries christian outreach today's sermon is called blood money to read matthew chapter 27 verse 3 when judas who had betrayed him saw that jesus was condemned he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders i have sinned he said for i have betrayed innocent blood what is that to us they replied that's your responsibility how uh, the Pharisees and the scribes that funded, they were willing to fund the death and the betrayal of Jesus Christ. And now Judas had some form of remorse. And after he betrayed Jesus, he wanted to take the money that originally persuaded him to betray Jesus. He wanted to take this money and give it back to the Pharisees and scribes. Matthew chapter 27, verse 5, 6, and 7, and 8. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. Of uh, Judas, he took the 30 pieces of silver, he went into the temple of God. He went into the house of God and he threw the money at these allegedly evil Pharisees and scribes, right? And as he threw the money to them, the Pharisees and scribes looked at that money and they said it's blood money. The Pharisees and scribes acknowledged that it was against their law to put that blood money into the house of God. See, I wonder in America, have the church or the churches, have they got to the point where they've forgotten that not all money is good money. There is blood money. And I also want to point out this, that these Bible verses are in the New Testament. These Bible verses are in the New Testament. So whatever that means to you, it means something to God, the fact that it was in the New Testament. Do we have churches today that are willing to take sources of income from all different aspects? Are they willing to take money or be paid off by the mafia? Are they willing to be paid off by drug dealers? Are they willing to be paid off by crooked politicians? Are they willing to accept money from all avenues? I'm going to tell you, even myself, as uh, an evangelist, when God told me to go out to an Amish country and to give my testimony in an Amish church, God told me, that when I did that, that I was not to take any money from them if they offered me the money. And so I want to ask you, do you always feel that God is always going to give you money for obeying him and the things that he told you to do? And has God ever told you to reject money? See, if we've never rejected money, we have to consider, are we truly obeying God always? Because if God has told me there's times where I can't accept money, he's going to tell you there's going to be times where you can't accept money. We should not have so much faith and so much dependency and so much security in money than we do in God. So here you have these Pharisees and scribes. They rejected the money. 
They didn't even want it. And they said it's unlawful to put this money in the temple of God. It's unlawful. Because they recognized that it was blood money. That that money was used for evil. And that if they put that money in the temple of God, that there would be a curse upon that money. Even in a natural aspect in America in 2012, do you know that you can be convicted or accused of having blood money? See, if someone goes out and robs a bank and one of those bags of money falls out from the bank robber and you happen to see it and you run by and grab that stolen money, and you didn't realize that it either had dye on it or traces of invisible dye, or it had marked, the bills were marked, and you go ahead and take that money, and you knew, not being ignorant or innocent, but you were guilty because you knew where that money came from. You knew that it wasn't given to you by God. And you went ahead and grabbed that money, and you uh, stashed it under your bed, and you started spending it at random stores, and then the FBI does a research, and they track the money down, and it comes back to you. You will be found guilty of theft. You will be imprisoned. You will be found guilty of a federal offense. And I've learned today that it's better to have a little bit of money received from God than a whole lot of money received from the devil. Because that money that's received from the devil or the devil's purposes will be blood money and it will be cursed and it won't bring forth happiness. It won't bring forth peace. It won't bring forth satisfaction. And I believe, unfortunately, because of the greedy, money-hungry, prosperity preachers preaching that godliness is gain, they won't understand that not all money is blessed. Some money is cursed. And they will actually be shooting themselves in the foot by taking money from all sources. Even these Pharisees and scribes, had some form of integrity. You can accuse them of all kinds of things, but they had a little bit of integrity. Do we as Christians possess that same integrity? Are we bound by blood money? See, when we have the love of money, the devil will easily be able to manipulate us and cause us to do things that are against God's will. He will use us as slaves to blood money. There is a thing that was taking place in Africa called blood diamonds, which means that there were these political forces that were going into these villages in Africa, and they were enslaving these poor people and forcing them to mine for diamonds, forcing them to work in diamond fields. And they were killing those that did not want to uh, cooperate. And they were butchering those that didn't want to cooperate. And they enslaved these people so that they could have a monopoly on these diamonds. And they were calling them blood diamonds. Then you had these wicked, evil corporations in America that were funding this type of activity. Now, of course, the activity would be washed so that they wouldn't have to confess or admit to it, but then you have some of the American public and society that caught wind of it, and they refused to purchase these companies that were funding this type of activity. No, if you uh, want to get engaged to a woman and you want to show your appreciation because you have the ability to buy her a nice diamond, and you go out into a certain company, you want to get the diamond. Did you enslave anyone? Did you kill anyone? No, you didn't. But by you patronizing this company who was patronizing this type of activity, indirectly you're funding and you're enabling and you're embracing and you're supporting what's taking place. Well, as pastors, as Christians, we can do the exact same thing if we don't even have this bare minimum integrity that these chief priests had to not accept this money. 
You can't come thanking God, glory to God, because of his grace. You can't come to this ministry and pimp me around with all kinds of blood money and say, I'll give you this money. No, you won't. I will tell you so quick to your face, I'm not interested. I'm not impressed, and I'm not interested. I have to go with God. If God sends me into po poverty, I'm jumping on the diving board, and I'm diving right into it. If God sends me into middle class, then I'm diving into that. If God sends me into riches, then I'm diving into that. But I'm not trying to make nothing happen. I'm being led by what God leads me. God can make me poor. God can make me rich. And that's why I say I'm not neither a poverty preacher, but neither am I a prosperity of preacher because I am a God preacher. God has some people poor who went to heaven, and God has some people rich who went to heaven. I'm not chasing after, I'm not trying to force anything to happen. See, this is when we get caught up and we try to force ourselves to be poor or force ourselves to be rich. We'll be disrespecting what God has for us. The Bible did say godliness with contentment, that is great gain. So here you have Judas who hung himself. And after Judas hung himself, it said that the priests, they used the money. They used the money not for the house of God. They used this money to purchase a potter's field. was deemed back then as a worthless land. It was no good to produce harvest. It was no good to produce vegetables. It was no good to build a house on it. It was, so to speak, like a condemned land. And when they called it a potter's field, it's because you could get clay from the land and make pottery from it. And it only had that value, which back then they considered that land to be worthless to have no value. So this 30 pieces of silver, they took the 30 pieces of silver that they deemed to be worthless and they used it to purchase something else that's worthless. And they did it to bury foreigners because if they were a Jew and one of the Jews died, they had their whole entire law and custom and ritual that they would do to bury their own. But if it was someone who was a foreigner, they wouldn't waste the tax money. They wouldn't waste the temple money. They wouldn't waste their own people's money on a foreigner. They would first take care of their own. And then from the leftover of the worst, worthless blood money, they used that to purchase the potter's field to bury the foreigners. And my point is this, that if you have blood money, it's going to be worthless. You're not going to be able to do nothing with it. It's not going to prosper. It's only going to be used for dead. It's going to produce death. Dead curses is what it will produce. Matthew chapter 27, verse 9 and 10. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. So even these Pharisees and scribes who took the 30 pieces of silver, even by them doing that, the same money that was blood money, that was cursed money, that was used to sell out Jesus, to betray Jesus, even the Pharisees and scribes, when they used the money to purchase the potter's field, they were actually bringing to pass a prophecy. Do you know there was a particular day where I was in a particular church and the pastor of this particular church, it was time for him to take up a tithe and offering for his church. And I was from another church that was visiting this church. So we had one church visiting another church. And I sat in the middle row, 
And I remember them taking up an offering. No big deal. I gave an offering. And five minutes later, after they collected the offering, the pastor of this church took the money out of the offering and he started walking up and down the aisles of this church, counting the money that was taken in from the offering. And as he was counting the money, he grabbed the microphone and said, we need to take up another offering. And I said, okay, well, maybe they have uh, a need or they're short on the rent or they're short on the light bill, the heating bill. Maybe they have to pay taxes. Well, churches don't pay taxes on property. Maybe there's a logical, maybe he's taking up an offering for someone who just died and it's for the bereaved. I don't know. I'm trying not to judge. So the, the pastor takes up a second offering. Then he counts the second offering and he's got this cash in his hand. He's counting it, walking up and down the aisles. Then the pastor goes up to my pastor and says, I know who you are. You got money. You're on TV. How much money do you got? So he gets money from him. And then he walks back up to the pastor again the second time and says, I know you got more money than that. So then the pastor gives the other pastor more money for the second time. And then this pastor walks up and down these aisles again. And he goes into the aisle. He goes into the pew physically and goes into the little kids that are sitting down. And he says to the little kids, I know you have candy and cookie money too. And I want you to give me your candy and cookie money. Now, I was so shocked. I thought this man had to have been joking. He couldn't possibly be been serious. And I was waiting for him to bust out laughing. He didn't smirk. He didn't giggle. He had a straight look on his face. He wanted the candy and cookie money from the little kids in the church. Meanwhile, my peace and my joy, it left me so fast. It was gone. And the only thing that remained within my soul was get out of there. Yeah, I was there for my pastor. I was there for my church supporting another church. God said, get out of there. So then... I disobeyed God and I wrestled with the Spirit of God because I was a deacon and I wanted to support my pastor and I wanted to do all the self-control I could. And I didn't want to disrespect anyone in the house of God. So then the pastor, after shaking down the kids for candy and cookie money, he says, deacons, deacons, I want you to lock those doors Lock those doors until we get X amount of money. And I said, the devil is a lie. I grabbed my tambourine. I purposely jingled it as I walked out the door. I left. I left. And then as I walked into the parking lot, I saw the deacons and the musicians that were supposed to. This was in the middle of the church service. Middle of the church service. I saw the musicians who were supposed to be in the church. I saw them on the keyboard. I saw the deacons who were supposed to be in the church. They were actually in the parking lot, and I caught them with a jimmy, jimmying into someone else's car because it was a visitor visiting their church. Now, this deacon and this musician was supposed to be in the church. And I was not supposed to be leaving the shakedown. But instead, I listened to the voice of God who told me to get out of that church. And I did. I left. But as I left, I was not supposed to see these gentlemen with their jimmy breaking into people's cars to clean them out. Guess what I did? I called the police. I got on my cell phone. I said, 911, I'd like to report a robbery. <laughs> I reported these folks. 
robbing people, not in the church. Hey, they, they have to answer to God. And if those people give, that's between them and God. God, I'm st I don't know. But breaking into people's car, we draw the line there. If you come into the parking lot and I catch you breaking into people's cars, I will call the police on you and see you in jail. And then I'll come and preach to you in jail and say, you're wrong, but God loves you. <laughs> so I don't know who's more angry. I don't know if God is angry at the pastor for operating that way or if God's angry at the people for not giving to put the pastor in a situation where he has to operate like that. I don't know which one he's more angry, but I know for sure God is angry at that behavior. God is not happy with that type of stuff. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 19, 20, 21, and 22. Elijah said, After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Armin, or Aramin, by not accepting from him what he bought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right, he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. And Naaman had to be uh, dealt with, but eventually he obeyed. And through his obedience, he got healed of the leprosy. And it was proper. It was proper for Naaman to want to repay Elijah for healing him. But Elijah looked at it this way. Elijah did not heal him. God healed him. And Elijah at that time did not want money for what God did. Elijah was not charging Naaman for the healing. Elijah was not running a healing service in which people could pay money for their healing. It wasn't a, a, a service that he was charging. It was an obedience. Elijah was obedient to the voice of God and telling Naaman how to get healed. And Naaman was obedient to Elijah. And through all of this obedience, God blessed Naaman and healed him. And so when we as Christians get blessed and healed of God, it's the natural or spiritual reaction that we do want to give our money back to the people of God. Since I've been a Christian, I never needed a pastor to twist my arm, to beat me down, to preach uh, Malachi 3.10 a hundred times in order to coerce me, persuade me, or manipulate me to want to give money. No, I didn't need none of that. In fact, God touched my heart back when I was in jail to give sometimes over half of my commissary to people who didn't have before I even knew what tithes and offering was, before I even read the Bible verse, before I ever, ever even heard of Malachi 3.10, before I knew about any of those things by the Holy Spirit because God delivered me from suicide, because God delivered me from drugs and alcohol, because God healed the pain that no man could heal, because God cured me when money couldn't. I just wanted to repay back a God and give him, not because someone beat me down and, and preached some, some prosperity message that if I gave money, I would be blessed. No, I was blessed before I gave. And I wanted from the time that I got saved to this day, and even to this day, not to brag, but I don't, I don't think I've ever given 10%. I've always given 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200. 
And as you can see, I'm not starving. God takes care of me. He's taken care of me. He's delivered me when money could not do it. He delivered me when money could not do it. So Naaman wanting to give money to Elijah was proper is my point. But what was not proper was the, the, the wickedness of Gehazi. Now, I even like that the Bible called Gehazi a man of God. The Bible troubled itself to call Gehazi a man of God before they showed what the man of God did. The man of God lied and said, my master sent me back to you to get money. The man of God returned back to Elijah and lied to Elijah. That's two lies. First he lied to get the money, and then after he lied to get the money, he lied to the person who was the reason why he could have got the money because the man of God was the one that God spoke to. God didn't speak to Gehazi. God spoke to Elijah. And so he lied to Naaman, and then he lied to Elijah. And because of those lies that he did against God's people, the money that he got was cursed. My wife is my best friend. I think more important than anything else, you have to uh, be a friend. You have to, your wife should be, or your husband should really be your best friend. If you can't build that friendship, the romance aspect will fade. Right now we have a, a driven world where we're trying to move ahead and, and be our own person and we're not willing to sacrifice to the marriage. And the marriage has to come first. Um, of course, Christ has to be in it. As he sacrificed for his church, we need to be sacrificial in our marriages. Very simple. The other problem is communication. We're busy communicating with everybody else except our spouses. And uh, it's a problem today. Uh, we're on email, we're on Facebook, we're on this, we're on that, and we're communicating with everyone else but the person that's in the house with you. We've been married uh, uh, December the 20th of this year, will be 32 years. People don't stick to commitments. Um, when you take your wedding vows, I mean, you commit to uh, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. And you actually make a covenant, and I think that most people don't understand what a covenant relationship is. That means that two parties agree. They come together, and they commit to making things work. First of all, we need to make sure that it's God's will and that we are engaging in godliness. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And I believe that one of the reasons why that marriage is like it is, is because it's too easy, first of all, to get out. We've been married six years, dating me. So a lot of people in the church are currently in blended families right now. I think we've removed God out of a lot of the systems, our, our school systems, our court systems, and even from the family standpoint, a lot of families are the fast-paced moving world now. They don't sit down to eat anymore. They don't pray before meals. Um, rarely do you see the whole family at the church in one body. They're either off in separate parts of the church even. The foundation of marriage is based on a three-court strand, and a lot of families are living a one- or two-court strand. Um, you know, with a three-court strand, it's you, your wife, and God. As it makes up a strand, it's not easily broken.